We're going to start on time. Welcome, everyone. My name is Ara Zixi, and I am the director of the School for Advanced Studies in the Arts and Humanities, and also a classicist. <laughs> um, and the first thing that I'm going to say is that Sasa's home, Western University, is located on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Luna Paywalk, and Chinal Trump peoples on lands connected with the dish with one spoon wampum and Sombra Treaties of 1796. And when we repeat this acknowledgement of indigenous peoples' relationships to the land, my intention at least is to explicitly articulate indigenous peoples' ongoing presence and their rights to self-determination, as well as my own responsibilities to uphold those rights to contribute to the work of truth and reconciliation, and to celebrate, honor, and educate myself about indigenous cultures. So I acknowledge sacred teachings, such as love, respect, courage, honesty, wisdom, humility, and truth to guide our approach to furthering equity, diversity, and inclusion at Western for all of our benefits. So those of you who know me very well at all will know that the Iliad is the work of poetry that I love most of all, and I will arm wrestle you for that. <laughs> <laughs> like the miraculous shield, the maker god Hephaestus crafted for its hero, Achilles, the Iliad contains an entire universe. People might say it's about the Trojan War, a myth about remotely ancient time, but I say it's about you. And it's about me and all of us together with its deep and close journeying over the topography of what it means to be human and so akin to the divine but still subject to death and the loss of what we love most. Joe Goodkin is someone who has deep intimacy with and appreciation for the Iliad. So when I saw that he was available, I didn't think for more than one minute <laughs> before inviting him to come and visit us today. In the tradition of the ancient bards, he's composed the Blues of Achilles, a cycle of songs based on the characters of the poem. Joe is a Chicago-based singer, songwriter, and guitarist. He has released 13 albums of original music under the name Paper Arrows and his own name. His has been described variously by music critics as Mutations era Beck, cutting his teeth on the early works of Leonard Cohen. <laughs> a successor to Woody Guthrie and a tremendous and fearless songwriter. He has composed two modern folk opera retellings of Homer's epic poems, The Odyssey and The Iliad, which he has performed over 400 times in all 50 US states and in Europe as a guest of such institutions as Harvard, Stanford, UC Berkeley, and many more, and now the University of Western Ontario. Joe's 13th album, Constellations and Desolations, is available everywhere you can get digital music. So please join me in welcoming Joe, who will perform the Blues of Achilles, and then remain available for a discussion period afterwards and merchandise the sales. And Sing of endless blood soaked earth, and bodies crumbling into dust. Man turned animal with rage, consumed by violence and lust. Turn back as far as time Long before the reign of Rome I sing tonight and every day For those who never made it home All of them were born All of them were blood All of them were flesh Somebody loved Mother weeping 
weeping for her son. A father begging for his boy. A wife collapsing at the news. A child puts away his toy. Falling in the field The body burned The grief goes on So many souls Without a voice So many ghosts That can't move on All of them were born All of them were blood All of them were flesh Somebody This is how being a performer works. I just got done saying to you, we shouldn't be so precious, uh, precious about this performance because the ancient Greek bards So I present to you, let's not be precious about this performance in the form of, a, I guess Achilles' ghost is coming in to join us or something. Uh, thank you so much for such a gracious invitation. And thank you so much for coming out to listen to these cycle, this cycle of songs I call the Blues of Achilles. Uh, you're gonna hear 16 more of them. When I started doing this a couple years ago, I was calling it an interpretation of Homer's Iliad, but I've settled on actually calling it a conversation with Homer's Iliad, because I think that better um, frames it in, in an oral tradition, in competing or versions that work together to tell a complete story. So the next song you'll hear in my conversation with Homer's Iliad is Achilles, the greatest Greek hero, pulling himself out of battle because of a disagreement he has with his commander, Agamemnon. And then doing what Greek heroes often do, which is going and crying to their mother about it. So we'll hear from Achilles and right from wrong, and then we'll hear from his mother Thetis immediately following. Maybe she'll want to come in too. <laughs> Open me up and look inside. See the dark I cannot hide. Or well, I may be a killer in the sun. There's a way these things are done. If you take away my pride, then you take away my pride. Well, I will close and lock the door, and I won't fight in your God. I've got grief as deep as These graceless days are long But each night when I lay down to sleep Well, I know right from wrong Maybe I should strike you down Tear out your heart without sound. We'll leave your shell for the world to see. What happens when you violate me? But now something holds me back, like a hand that keeps me from attack. Right. 
don't you be afraid, my dear. Don't you be afraid, my dear. In your time of need, I'll always be near. Don't you be afraid, my dear. In every dream, I'll come to you. In every dream, I'll come to you. Walk into the ocean and I'll meet you in the blue. In every dream, I'll come to you. I'll make you a melody so clear. I'll make you a melody so clear When you cry, I'll be the one who gathers up your tears I'll make you a melody so clear They'll tell your story when Tell your story when you're gone. A mother's love is even stronger than a song. Tell your story when you're gone. Tell your story when So, Agamemnon, excuse me, Achilles, the reason he's pulled himself out of battle is he's had this disagreement with Agamemnon, his commander, over what was called in that world war brides. Not a PC term for it, but it was women that they took as part of their raids. And um, Agamemnon has had to give up his war bride, Perseus, and has taken Achilles' war bride. And that's what this, agree this agreement's over in this 10th year of the war. So, the woman that Agamemnon has to give up, Perseus, is the linchpin for this whole story. And somehow, in 15,000 lines of poetry, Homer couldn't write a single thing for her to say. <laughs> Zero. Zilch. Enter me. A great opportunity for a conversation with the text to fill in this space. So we'll hear Perseus um, singing This Is How It Feels. And then we'll hear from another female character who probably has the most to say, who's at the center of this war, and that's Helen, uh, who was abducted, or possibly not, by Menelaus, Agamemnon's brother. I am a bird without a song Flying through the night until it's gone I am a bird without a song I am a dawn that never breaks A dream within a ghost who never wakes I'm a dawn that never breaks Well this is how it feels To be a wound that never heals To wonder if you're even real This is how it feels I am a wave upon a beach Go back against my will into the sea I am a wave upon a beach well, This is how it feels Never heals to wonder if you're even real. This is how it feels. I am a golden field of green, cut down by a farmer, so nothing. I am a golden 
of the uh, Trojan warriors in a song that is in conversation with book six of the Iliad called The Goodbye Lullaby. My love, my love, my love, don't you be afraid. I'll be home before you know. Everything My son, my son, my son I hate to say goodbye I'll be back when the sun goes down To sing you a lullaby Because this is how it's been how it will be Men have always left to fight in the name of glory My heart, my heart, my heart Can we laugh before I go
So it will either thrill or disgust you, or maybe both. You know I'm going to skip about 10 books of the story right now. Uh, but what happens is that with Achilles out of battle, it starts to go very poorly for the Greeks. Hector makes a charge without the greatest warrior. The Greeks get pushed all the way back to their ships. And Achilles, second in command, Patroclus, begs, and Achilles allows him to go fight in this place to try to push the Trojans off. And then Hector kills Patroclus, and Achilles learns of it. So we'll do that threesome right there. We'll do uh, Patroclus going to battle, dying, and Achilles learning of it. What kind of love is deeper than the sea, stronger than the iron of the shield? Born in the heart, and brighter than the sun, so certain that it will never heal. What kind of love? Goes higher than the sky, somewhere out beyond the broken blue. Underneath my skin, darker than the night, it's my love for you. Well, I will gladly wear your sorrow, like armor clasped around my chest. I will lead your troops to battle Surely as the sun sets in the west What kind of love is older than the earth and sweeter than the promises of you Falling in my tears and dripping in my sweat It's my love I will listen to your heartbeat In the silences you make I don't need to hear you tell me What you can give, I will take What kind of love will shine after I'm gone Longer than the days are true. Coursing of blood that's flowing in my veins. It's my love for you. It's my love for you. So dear, crying tears that I did not know there. Kings who stand as tall as trees, crushed by endless waves of grief. A man with glory in his name. Thousands of his kin dreamt of going home again. All of them were born, all of them were blood, all of them were flesh, like.
gates will fall we'll throw the children from the walls all of them are gone all of them are Ah 
sorrow like a shroud. One man saves, another steals. But it's all the same, all the same to me. Two-thirds of the way through writing a cycle of songs that treats all the characters in the Iliad with empathy, and then you get to Agamemnon's song. I think this is where you earn your keep as a songwriter. So I submit to you, open for discussion afterwards, Agamemnon's song, My Love for You, sung to his brother. Richer than a crown of brilliant jewels, sharper than a sword, straighter than an arrow. It's my love for you, the kind of love turns strangers into brothers, puts brothers back into their mother's wombs. Together in the darkness and holding on to life, it's my love for you. I will gladly raise an army, pull your honor from the fire. I will keep your soul from danger. I will fight and fight and fight and never tire. Kind of love is harder than war, thicker than the walls of a tomb. Louder than a battle, softer than a dove. It's my love. has his bride back, he's got Patroclus' body back, but he's still racked with grief and anger. And so he does his best to cope with this by doing what Achilles does. Uh, he has an elaborate funeral for Patroclus, and he also goes out on the battlefield and kills a lot of people, because that is what Achilles does best, and he thinks this is going to solve all his problems, and we've all been there, I think. Um, so we'll hear Achilles' coping songs, we'll hear Don't You Be Afraid, My Friend, and The World All About. I'll burn your body till it's gone I'll burn your body till it's gone The flames will take your flesh Leave us with your song I'll burn your body till it's gone I'll sing your melody I'll sing your melody so clear. Well, there was no one in the world I held so dear. I'll sing your melody so clear. I'll hear your voice in every dream. I'll hear your voice in every dream.
2020. I don't know if you remember what was happening in March of 2020, um, but immediately following this performance, I had to cancel all my in-person shows, like most musicians, and I got a chance to take this virtual for almost an entire year, uh, which would turn out to be sort of a gift for this material. Just as I started coming back to do it in front of actual people, one of the first shows I did was at a school called Millsaps in Jackson, Mississippi, and some couple brought their eight-year-old son to the show and sat him in the front row. And we got to this song, and we got to this line, rain fly through your mouth, and clear as day, this little voice in the front row just goes, ew! <laughs> and because I studied classics, I couldn't help but educate. So I told him, kid, if this was really the Iliad, this song would go on for like five hours, okay? I'm doing you a big favor here. We're getting most of the gross stuff out of the way in this one song. Um, so I don't know if he remembers that, but hopefully he does. <laughs> Achilles kills Hector in front of his parents standing on the walls and drags his body around. Hector's wife, Andromache, is actually away from the action. She doesn't see it happen, but she sort of hears it happen. So we will do Andromache learning of her husband's death. The song is called My Love. My love, my love, my love, your son has said. As long as I remain, I will not forget the words, the words, the words you spoke before you left. They are branded in my heart and they echo in my 
Drags, Hector's Body, Back to the Camp, Anger Still Not Gone, go figure. <laughs> Does unspeakable things to the body. And Hector's father, Priam, the king of Troy, is so distraught. His mother is too. His father is especially distraught that he can't get his son's body back to properly bury it. That he gets to the point where he does the absolute unthinkable. This old man goes across the plain from the city of Troy to the Greek camp by himself, essentially, and appears in Achilles' tent gets down on his knees and begs for Hector's body back. And this is Hands of Grief. Well, I'm before you on my knees Kissing the hands of my grief My song was cut down in the fight And your hands took him from He was strong as a lion With a full head of hair Now his cape with dust and rock But I still see him everywhere If he had listened to my warning
please, Father, don't you cry. Well, I will help you stand. We'll say a prayer together. Wash the grief off of our hands. Join me at the table. body back and he gets to take it back to try to bury it. So we have to do that. We have to do one more song and that is Hector's mother, Priam's wife, Hecuba watching the body come back to try to be buried. Thank you guys so much for this opportunity to play these songs. Uh, it's very, very special to me. I think it's special to the tradition and the characters and the truth of this story uh, and the love in this story. That was really beautiful. I'll ask, answer any questions about any of these songs uh, afterwards. I'll have plenty of time, and thanks again. This is a reprise of some, someone, Somebody Love. That's very easy for me to say. <laughs>
have to know the Iliad as well as maybe I do to love that as much as I did. I hope not. Um, I know a lot of you have been thinking about how to translate one thing into another thing, right? One thing into an art form. And for me, what you did with the Iliad here was a beautiful interpretation. You know, it was as meaningful as any kind of a scholarly treatment, I think. So thank you for that. Thank you. I wonder if anyone has a question or questions. Or two. Or seven. <laughs> yeah. If you want, I, shall I let you yeah, I can, questions? I can, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. Just do that and I'll um, Did you change your s style of music at all for the two like sort of concept albums you've done? Um, or is it, have you sort of just stuck with your, um, what you've always like done and sort of translated it on to? Yeah, um, I think if you listen to all the music I've made, uh, which is a lot of it. Um, you'll hear a lot of common themes stylistically, whether I'm working by myself or with a band or um, telling sort of explicit stories like this where I'm writing for a character or I'm just, or I'm just uh, you know, uh, um, r r writing a less narrative or a less character-driven uh, format. I think this gave me a chance to embrace some formats uh, as part of the process that I don't normally get to write in. So. A lot of times if I'm writing for a non-classics interpretation, I look for something novel to do with like a chord progression or a melody. I want to put a spin on it. With this, I was really, I wanted all the patterns to feel really comfortable. I wanted people to recognize them. I didn't even care if I was stealing them from people because I thought that's what a tradition is. Like, tradition is another word for stealing from other people, basically. So there, there, I hope there are kind of recognizable moves in this. And you know, that's not to say that I didn't try to find little spins to put places to turn people's ears, but I was really conscious of writing music that was comfortable and familiar so that people could focus on the words um, as closely as possible. So, does that answer the question? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering, so before you sang the song of Agamemnon's perspective, you sort of, you had this little disclaimer of sorts of, you know, he's not great. And yeah. then, you know, it suggested to me that your approach was to be empathetic to yes. all of the characters that mm -hmm. you brought. And so I wondered, I wondered about that and like, yeah why the choice not to, not to, I don't know. There was nothing there was no rageful villain. Yeah. about the songs. Yeah. And I think that's really interesting, right? Because that's the beginning yeah. of the Iliad, right? right. It's rage and, right. and wrath. And, so, and I think that's beautiful, but I want to know yeah. more about yeah. why. Um, so in my head, somebody already did the anger of Achilles pretty well. <laughs> 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 we oh. don't say. Yeah. Uh, and I thought about the fact that you could take the word akos or akon and substitute it for mainen and it would scan. Mm -hmm. So you could very easily, very easily, you know, probably did, maybe somebody did. Uh, akos means grief, it's in Achilles' name, ako, ako heos, right? Um, so in embracing this idea of a conversation, if I just sang the anger again, first of all, I'd be a puddle on the floor. <laughs> I already am. <laughs> um, second of all, I don't know if it adds anything. You know, I, like so. The Agamemnon thing ties in there, where I saw it as an opportunity to go into the space around his story and say, I know it's really easy to crap an Agamemnon for legitimate reasons in the plot, 
but he's also another person trapped in the world of war, trying to at times do his best and messing up. And this may piss some people off, but Hector's just as crappy a commander as Agamemnon is. He might even be crappier, you know. So like, why don't people talk about him? You know, I know why. Because there's Book Six, and you feel great about him as a human being, and even that's a little weird. But if you look at the text, there are two or three places where he shows obvious concern for his brother, and I thought that's really relatable. You know, like that's a real that's a real behavior, and it's and it's commendable, and everybody can identify with it. And if I'm going to do one song for him, we've got. The one where he's the mess, you know, whatever he messes up. Let's talk about these other impulses that that, that are human and, and relatable. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, I found it really moving that you had Thetis say that she would sing the song with Achilles, yeah. which is the Iliad in yeah. some sense. Yeah. And, um, and that she she says that to him as a, a comfort yeah, yeah. for what he's going through. And I I just wondered if you could expand on that decision. Yeah, um, I mean, I think there's a, you know, his relationship. So I don't really have any of the gods or goddesses in, in the story. Uh, she's really functioning, I think, like a mother more than somebody who's divine. Um, and I thought about what she gives him in the places we see them interact and her concerns and what she knows. And like, when you see her sort of just as a mother, as a, as a caretaker, to me, she it becomes so human. Like, all of her impulses are... You know, she's she's sort of powerless to stop this thing happening, but she wants to do the one thing that might that might ease his his suffering or his pain. And I thought about you know that idea that if she could guarantee that his that his name would be sung, uh, or if she could do it, you know that might be the best she can do at this point. Like she can't change the outcome. So does that yeah, address it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, based on something you just said, um, this is a very human like perspective. Yeah. Can you expand upon why you decided not to like go into the realm of divinity? Yeah, I can. <laughs> um, so my kind of north star for storytelling on this was a Tim O'Brien book called The Things They Carry, and he's a, a Vietnam veteran. Yeah, um, and so he wrote about his experiences in Vietnam in sort of the, in short stories in, in fiction, um, and he has a story in that collection called How to Tell a True War Story. And I thought, what I'm reacting to in the Iliad is a truth. Like it's a uh, you said it in your introduction. It's, it's it's not a narrative truth, it's a story truth. And I think Tim O'Brien says sometimes story truths can be truer than, than happening truths. But I thought if I'm trying to get my modern audience to connect with a truth, a reality, as soon as I introduce a bickering group of people on a mountaintop, <laughs> that reality goes away. You know, you know, you're adding this extra realm. You just said it right. You know, you're a supernatural realm. And that probably would not that wouldn't have been true clearly for an ancient audience. I think they serve a I think they're fascinating, the gods. I mean, I think they serve to release from some of the action that's going on on the battlefield. And so I had to find different ways to put release after my own songs in, because I can't go up to the bickering family <laughs> on the mountaintop. But that was, that was my thinking. I thought, if I want this to be a true war story, I, have to, I can't distract my audience with this. And you know, then once I start, it's also practical, like once I start writing songs for the gods and goddesses, where do I cut it off? You know, where do I, how many, you know, how many do I, um, write for. Now I'm up to 24 songs and like, you know, I can barely keep it together for 52 minutes as it is. So, yeah, good question. Yeah? Yeah, so the sounds of the blues and folk traditions and music carry with them, I think, certain kind of histories and context. Yeah. I'm curious if you're sort of thinking about how the histories of that genre yeah. might reflect how we, I guess, access the Iliad. Yes. Maybe even put another way, is there something how that genre opens up Can you tell him about to jump into this and talk for like 10 minutes excitedly? <laughs> um, so maybe some of you, good lord. Sorry, that was very Iliadic. There was a bird just went right to left. Is that good or bad? I can't remember. It's good? Right to left is good? OK, good. OK. Um, so maybe some of you have already had this, but you know when you say something that you think is true, but you don't actually check out whether it's true or not for a long time? And you repeat it enough that you're like, I don't know if I want to go check and see if this is true, because I think it is true. So um, I thought there were parallels between the American blues tradition and Homeric epic and Homeric bards for a long time. Um, and it wasn't until COVID, and, I, and in fact, I wrote this piece before I went and checked any of this out. So it was like kind of an intuition, I think. Um, uh, 
But I had this idea that the subjects of, of blues songs were very similar to some of these things that characters in the Iliad are going through. I had this idea that blues was like one person with a guitar, you know. Um, I had this idea that uh, there were itinerant bards in, in, in the Delta who went around swapping songs. And, and you know, so I had all this history of the blues kind of informally. But then I went back and started chasing like the details. And I found that it was even broader and sort of more specific actually than, than I thought. So American blues music has this period of development where it's not documented. It's totally oral tradition. Um, and that's up until the invention of recording technology in the mid 1920s, right? So Homeric bards, non-literate. Blues, blues bards, non-recorded, probably non-literate as well. Then technology comes in and changes things, right? Recording um, changes what blues musicians, can, any musician can do. But this, this tradition gets kind of fixed in this form, just like the Iliad gets fixed in a textual form. So like Robert Johnson to me is my Homer. Like he's, guy, he's not an oral bard. He's a guy who's taking all this tradition and making the perfect, the best versions of these to some sense. And I'm going to gloss over whether there's a home or not, because I don't want to fight. Um, uh, or maybe I won't have a fight. So I went about chasing all this down, and I thought, well, that's like this is confirming what I my instinct. And then I got to this book called Big Road Blues: uh, Creativity and Folk Tradition by a guy named uh, David Evans, who's a music scholar at Memphis University of Memphis. And I'm reading along, and on page 50, he just drops. Uh, working in very much the same way as Albert Lord studied the Gooselar Bards to come up with his Homeric theory in this blues book. And I'm like, was this book, like I'm the audience for this book. It's like a Venn diagram and it's just me. And I page to the back and this guy studied under Albert Lord and Comp Lit at Harvard. And he applied the, so Albert Lord is the, the person along with uh, his mentor, Milman Perry, who sort of crystallized this idea we have that the Iliad was, a, was an oral performance first. And he studied these bards in the 19, 1930s, 40s, and 50s who could perform for like seven, eight hours you know, off the top of their head. And he studied the language signatures and he sort of found all these language signatures of oral poetry in the Iliad. And it, really, it changed, it's still the accepted scholarship for the most part. So, Yes, there's something about the blues that I find parallel to this. And on top of that, like I said, you know, blues songs are about grief and love. And, and you know, it's called the blues of Achilles because of his blues, but also because of the music, but also because of the tradition. So, yeah. That only took about eight minutes, so it was good. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Yes? I have, actually, I have kind of, I have two questions. I can't decide which one to ask. You can ask both. It's your... Um, so, the first question then is, is like the, the, the ancient Greeks refer to the Iliad as the rage of Achilles, yeah. which is like the first two words of the poem, right. and it's about uh, and it's about uh, violence, mm -hmm. violent revenge, right? And yet you, in a sense, have made it in your version much more about love. Like yeah. you have written a series of love songs. Mm -hmm. And I, I would just love you to uh, yeah. comment on that a little bit. Yeah, so that was something that I was very self-conscious about when I finished it. I thought, this did not turn out <laughs> the way I thought it would. Like, um, and uh, I thought, well, it is interesting, though, because what I've done by trying to tap into the characters and their experiences is everybody in the story is acting out of concern or care for somebody mm -hmm. on some level at times. Everybody. That's at the center of everybody's behavior. And I think that's true of war in general, the more you, what you read about war. And I thought, well, if that's the case, how do we arbitrate whose love is more important than anybody else's on the battlefield? Like, why is Agamemnon's love for his brother less important than take your pick? Um, and so I thought, well, that's, that's interesting. I've like written myself into this idea that I'm a little uncomfortable with. <laughs> But it feels right. And so then, this is kind of like my story about finding this David Evans book. At, it wasn't until after I wrote these songs that I read the essay, uh, Iliad or a Poem of Force, by a uh, philosopher Simone Bay, right? And she's writing in the 1940s, I think, or late 30s, early 40s in World War II. It's a really wonderful essay. It's not very long. But she has a line in there that's, uh, there's no form of human love that the Iliad doesn't consider. So that I was like, okay, if it's good enough for Simone Bay, <laughs> that means I'm not completely making this up. Like, and I had to go through the organic process of identifying with the characters to find that. But to me, that made it even more meaningful because I arrived at the same conclusion she did through this process of interpreting it. So my second question, Milo, I'm going to try to connect it. Okay. Good luck. Uh, I, I'm I'm sure that as we were listening 
and watching the lyrics on the screen, I, I mean, I'm sure I'm not the only one that was just thinking about headlines yeah. and news stories. And if we had lived during the Vietnam War, or the, you know, the, the you know, any war, yeah. that would be the case, right? We're seeing, yeah. we're we're thinking about what's happening in the world, and we we contemplate those events with so much horror and Distance. sense of well, um, well, ho like, but also a sense of kind of helplessness. Yeah. And I and I really don't want to romanticize anything here, but I'm wondering. If we can do what you did with those events, can we think about them in terms of everybody who is participating is acting out of love for someone? Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I this I put this record out, a recording of it, which by the way is available for sale over here <laughs> and digitally too. We can talk about that. Come in. Um, <laughs> the, the week it came out was was when Russia invaded Ukraine. Right. Like, or this came out like the week after. So like, I was talking to journalists and there were pictures of essentially children being thrown from the walls like on television, right? Mm -hmm. And yes, it was immediately relevant. Um, and then I, something I thought was all these Russian soldiers have mothers too. <laughs> you know, everybody, there's some, like exactly what you just said. And I'm not doing that to, I don't know, dodge around, you know, some people being more responsible or not. Right. And once you get, in, like, we have enough human history that war is not an aberration. It is part of our condition. And the, the less we think about it like an aberration and the more we confront it in real terms, I think the better. I think then we talk about it less as like, oh, now we're not at war. Well, every, somebody's at war all the time, like, all the time. Like, there's a beautiful version of the Iliad called Anne Iliad by Dennis O'Hare and Lisa Peterson. It's a play. And this doesn't ruin anything, but like the bard in that play at some point lists all the wars in human history instead of a catalog of ships, <laughs> the bard has a catalog of wars. And you can, like, I've seen it twice. It goes on for five minutes. And you can just see the audience just like melting towards the floor as this thing. It's an amazing, like, it's, it's incredible. But it's, it proves the point. It's like, there's always, this, ha this is human conflict. This is human violence. This is a part of who we are, whether or not we like it, so. On that right now, yeah. So you're a classics guy and a music guy. Yes. <laughs> so just as students, like, how did you bring those two passions together? Ooh, buddy. Um, uh, I'm glad you asked that because I think uh, it was not, I didn't set out to do this. This was not my plan when I majored in classics. I didn't say, yes, the modern bar job's open. I'll go apply <laughs> for it. <laughs> um, I'll get on monster.com. That's still a thing. Um, uh, it was something that developed very, very, very organically. The first piece I wrote in this vein was a version of the Odyssey, uh, which is called Joe's Odyssey. You can find it at joesodyssey.com. And I wrote that in 2002. And it took me, um, it basically took me probably over 10 years to start treating it like it was part of my career, and part of like what I do. I wrote it out of almost like a sense of if I could do it. It was almost like an extension of a school project. And I never thought, of, so in that way, it was kind of cool because it was so unselfconscious. Like it was just, I got to the end of it and liked it. And then I was like, oh, who's going to sit still for this? <laughs> you know, and that was how I started building a performance. When I got to this piece, this is that's 15 or 16 years later, this was much more conscious. This was like, I already had a career going around doing this all over the world. Um, but really the answer has just been, I just keep doing it. And I tried to set aside, at first there was a lot of anxiety because I didn't have a model for what I was doing. I, I was not quite a musician, I was not quite an academic person. I was filling some of those same slots, like I was filling a lecture slot, just like I am right now. But like when I went to give an elevator pitch on what I do, it needed to be a really long elevator ride. <laughs> so I was like, it's kind of a lecture, it's kind of music, it's kind of this. So that was something that took me a long time to, to see as a strength. Like if you're by yourself doing something, that means you're not in competition. Like, I'm the guy if you want modern <laughs> folk operas, as far as I can tell. Like, uh, so I very, very slowly and, you know, when I felt it was right, started building up an infrastructure around what I do um, to reach out for bookings. And I'm to the point now where I play these pieces about 50 times a year. Um, I played them, like, my next big scale tour is to the UK and Ireland to do it, my Odyssey piece six times over there in two weeks. Um, I sort of took my time with it and I 
I made sure it wasn't the only thing I had to do to make a living too. That was another big thing. I always had something else. I wasn't like relying on this thing I love to pay my bills, even though it has become something that pays my bills. So, is that? Yeah. yeah. No. yeah. Did you get more out of the two worlds when you brought them together? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I don't, you know, I'm, I feel so lucky to have them. I feel like, I, and I, I don't mean this in an egotistical way, I don't think anybody could tell this story the way I, I tell it. I think somebody else could do just as good a job, but this is like the intersection of everything I've ever been interested in in the world. Music, classics, um, uh, veterans affairs, teaching, like it's all, everything I've ever found interesting is basically in this piece and continues. And it, it's not a, it, just like an old tradition, this is not a fixed thing for me. Like I go out and you know, I'm gonna do this three more times this week and every time is a little bit different, and every time I mess different things up, and every time I save certain things, every time I find things, so, yeah. Maybe that's another thing, it's like never, see everything as a process. See everything as a process and focus less on the product, and the product takes care of itself at some point if your process is good. Yeah. I yeah. Yes. In our capacity to read the text along. Hey, look at the time, everybody. Let's not okay. You know, like a, you know, a performance, a musical performance. Yeah. I'm not thinking about reading yeah. along the lyrics, right? But it puts us in such an interesting position as a local listener and a reader in yeah. a form of poetry in a sense, too. So I was just wondering if there was anything you wanted to sort of reflect on with respect to how that yeah. kind of splits us I mean, as I, I, as audience I, in yeah. terms of how we're engaging. Yeah, I sort of want to have my cake and eat it, too, in this, Fair right? Enough. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm acknowledging that we're a visual culture and a literal culture. Now, these songs are written specifically to allow, I think, for the text not being there for people to get them. That's why you see these repeated lines over and over. That's why you see the cyclical blues composition where the last line of the form is the same as the first. That's very purposeful. I have done it without the projection. It, it, it can be done. Uh, the projection just makes me less nervous about people in the audience that don't know the story. And I think it also... Yeah, and it allows, it's a concession sort of, but not really. Yeah. It allows also, I think, the audience to see how I already varied this thing that I wrote not that long ago, both consciously and unconsciously. You can see oral variation happening in real time, which I think is kind of neat. And that's also what I do with my Odyssey, and I found that really, really, really useful for audiences. People seem to like it, so I kept doing it with this. Yeah? Just as a comment, it's also really interesting for like Homeric perception in yeah. that it's textual and oral. Yeah. Yeah, and which which Homer which Homer was for a while. It was you know, it didn't just shut off the valve of this stuff when they when they got to writing, right? One more maybe, anybody? So let me just do. This is what Homer would have done. Um, I have a QR code. <laughs> um, if you scan this, it'll take you to the recording of it, and I believe maybe my website as well. I can't remember, but. Uh, there is a digital version of it that's on Spotify and YouTube and, and all the places you get your nearly free digital music. Um, I will say I recorded the piece with a famous crank analog engineer named Steve Albini who recorded the second Nirvana album and the Pixies and Jason Molina and all this music I love. He and I, we did this whole recording in one day to tape live, like half inch tape. It was, I wanted it to be presented like a blues recording like they used to record. And it sounds really good digitally, because he's amazing. But I do have also have a vinyl edition for sale for, I think, 30 Canadian dollars. I'm still not clear on this. <laughs> but that's what we, I was selling it for last night. So um, if you're not a vinyl person, I also have t-shirts. This amazing artwork I had commissioned uh, by an artist in the UK named Flaro, who does classically inspired artwork. Um, it's a really, she did an amazing job with this. She also did the back of the album cover, which is amazing, The Crying Horse. Um, so, and then I, I have posters of the artwork for sale as well as stickers, um, if you're into that sort of stuff. Um, again, what Homer would have said, I'm on social media. Uh, so you can find me there, at Joe Goodkin. I really, really appreciate the opportunity to share these songs for you guys, and really the wonderful questions. Like that's, talk about a gift, like getting to hear your audience talk about what they've gotten out of your material is like, it's amazing, especially when the material means as much to you as it does. So I'll stick around here too. I, I don't have anywhere to be. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, and if anybody has any other questions or wants to pick up some merch, come up and say hi. Thank you. And thank you all for the great questions. Yeah. And for your panel.